All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the second session of the UC SERAP Racial Equity in Extension webinar series. I'm Stephanie Pereira with the UC Statewide Integrated Pest Management Program. I'm also here with Sonia Brode of the UC Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program, who will be telling us a little bit more about the webinar series before we get started, and Clint Zhu, who will be running our polls and troubleshooting any technical problems. Uh, before we get started, I want to cover a few important details for this webinar. You won't be able to use your microphone during the webinar. If you have questions for any of the panelists or if you have any technical problems, please use the Q&A option and that's located in the Zoom navigation bar. We'll also use the chat feature to share any resources or organizations that are mentioned. Uh, live automated captions are being provided for the webinar. If you do not wish to see these, you can switch them off by clicking on CC Live Captions in the Zoom navigation bar and selecting Hide Captions. Uh, we are recording this webinar, so you'll be able to go back and listen to any part of it if you wish to do so. The recording will be made available on the UCANR YouTube channel. At the end of the webinar, we'll be providing a link to the feedback survey that you can use to let us know how this webinar went and how it can be improved. Um, we will add that link to the chat a few minutes before we close the webinar. By participating today, your contact information will be added to an email list that we use to advertise upcoming webinars. You can opt out of those emails if you do not wish to receive them. Okay, so before we get into the content, I want to pass the mic over to Sonia for a few minutes, who will tell us a little bit more about the Racial Equity in, in Extension webinar series and a little bit about this webinar as well. Sonia, take it away. Yeah, thanks a lot, Stephanie. I'm very happy to welcome everyone to this second in our series of webinars on achieving racial equity in agricultural and food systems extension work. And I'm really excited about our three panelists today, so I especially want to thank them for making time for this. Um, I also want to acknowledge the Western Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program of USDA for the professional development funding that has been provided for this series. So as part of a public sector institution, UC SEREP's goal for this series is to focus attention on the broad issues having to do with serving all of our clientele, which in California, as you know, includes a very sizable population of people of color, certainly in the general population, but also um, including in the agriculture and natural resources sectors. So last week we had panelists who talked about how extension organizations like the UC system and others might better serve farm workers who are people who do a lot of the farming in California, but they do it as employees. So today we are going to focus on farmers of color. So people who are the owners and or main operators of their own farms. So what's meant by a farm? Well, typically in USDA or IRS terms, something that's called a farm or a ranch is usually considered to be a commercial business with intent to generate profit or income. But having said that, I also wanna acknowledge that there's quite a bit of subsistence food production that happens in California, either for the household's own consumption or for trading and giving away to family and friends. And um, so, you know, how we define farms is definitely up uh, for debate and discussion. But also the concept of farmer of color or producer of color, I want to talk a little bit more about that since we had a question on that uh, coming in through the registration. So um, I'm going to be using the agricultural census data, which is national data, and the latest that we have is from 2017. Um, and they, they talk about um, race and also ethnicity. And I just wanna remind everybody that both of those are socially constructed uh, terms. And so, you know, what constitutes how people think of farmers of color or, or what that means changes over time and different people may have different ideas of that. But looking at the census of agriculture data um, there is about 124 or between 124 and 125,000 total producers in California. And um, of those, about six to 7,000 identify themselves as Asian or Asian American. 
And in the census, a person is Asian if they have origins in the peoples of the Far East, Southeast Asia, including the Philippines and or the Indian subcontinent. So that's 5% of all the producers in California. Then the next largest category um, among what we might consider farmers of color is producers who identify as more than one race. They make up over 1% or about 1,600 producers. After that, we have about 1,400 producers, also a little over 1% who identify as American Indian or Alaska Native. And then we have similar numbers of Black or African American producers and those who identify as Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander. So each of those two groups includes between four and 500 farmers. Um, so altogether, we're talking about over 10,000 producers of color around the state, if we're talking about those categories of race as defined uh, by the US Census and USDA. Another way to look at it is uh, through a, a ethnicity which the census accounts for separately from this category called race. So in California, there are over 14,000 or almost 12% of all producers who identify as Hispanic or Latino. So this is any person of Cuban, Mexican, Chicano, Puerto Rican, South or Central American or other Spanish culture or origin regardless of their race. So this is a little more like a cultural uh, identification. But again, um, yeah, just reminding that these are all cultural constructs and they change over time um, and different people think about who's a farmer of color maybe differently. So I hope that today we can spark some constructive conversation about these issues and we hope those conversations can continue even beyond this webinar series. And with that, I want to turn it back to Stephanie. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to start, before we get started, we have a few poll questions that we want to launch to get an idea of who's attending today. Um, so Clint has brought up the first two questions. And if you can't see these questions, we also have them on a slide. If you're not able to answer through the Zoom polls, then feel free to submit them directly to the panelists in the chat. Um, so the first question is, what is your job? And the second question is, where do you do most of your work? Okay, so we have people from all sorts of different jobs. Uh, a lot of people from cooperative extension, universities, nonprofit and community-based organizations, NRCS. Um, thank you all for being here. Again, a lot of people from Northern California, Central California, and some from Southern. And we have another person from another country. Wow, welcome. Okay, next uh, couple of, of questions. And you should be able to see that now. The first question here is how frequently do you work with farm owners or operators who are people of color? And what are the greatest challenges you face or anticipate uh, facing in serving farm owner operators of color? And if you don't see an option that fits your specific challenges, you can feel free to add that to the chat as well. Um, okay. So, oh, we have a lot of people who work with farmers of color at least a little bit, and then some who work with them about half the time and most of the time. Wow, that's great. Um, thank you for being here. Um, and then we have a wide array of challenges. It looks like finding farmers of color to work with is a very common challenge, as well as uh, language barriers, understand, understanding uh, systemic bar barriers and cultural differences, and then limitations of our job descriptions. And we have some people who are new and haven't faced barriers yet. So thank you for being here. Okay, so with that, I want to start transitioning over to the panel. Um, our panelists today are Victor Hernandez, Outreach Coordinator for the United States Department of Agriculture Natural Resource Conservation Service, Kanok Yisrael, Chief Seed Starter at Yisrael Family Farm, and Kristen Leach, grower at Namu Farm and organizer of second generation seeds. Um, and we're gonna start today with a presentation from Victor Hernandez, and then we'll begin the panel discussion. Um, so Victor has served as the outreach coordinator or an outreach coordinator and sociologist for the Natural Resources Conservation Service since 2015. Since then, he has evolved the Growing Together Latino Farmer Conference 
and the Growing Together Black Farmer Conference with Urban Farmers, among other outreach initiatives with farmer veterans and Southeast Asian farming communities. Victor has served as an employee development instructor for working effectively with Hispanic producers and has provided facilitation on equity, effective outreach, identifying biases, and building uh, cultural competencies. He has also served as a USDA Hispanic American Cultural Effort Board member and West Region Representative for the National Organization of Hispanic and RCS Employees. And he's the current president of the, of the National Organization of Professional um, Hispanic and RCS Employees. So Victor, um, with that, you can go ahead and share your slides. Good afternoon, Extension and Ag Professionals across the state of California. Uh, thank you so much for this invitation, uh, Stephanie, Sonia, Clint. It, it's it's truly an honor to be here with uh, you know just a, an amazing uh, a panel of speakers. You have uh, Canuck and and uh, um, Lynn. Uh, you know we just just amazing work that that you're doing across the field, and and I, I totally uh, I'm just in awe uh, that that you've uh, considered me to be here. You know I want to share with you a little bit about uh, the Natural Resource Conservation Service and how we're working and really striving toward equity in civil rights compliance uh, for conservation delivery. So uh, what are we gonna learn about today? Uh, we're gonna talk about why. Uh, why, why parity? Uh, and when, when we talk about parity, I want you that to equate that to equity. So why equity? Uh, we're gonna then talk about the how. Uh, and, and really I wanna emphasize be intentional. And, and, and then we'll, we'll finish off with the what. And you know that's strategic outreach support, um, and, and I think that if we put all these pieces together and then working collaboratively together, that, that our, our efforts can just go uh, have a tremendous impact across uh, California and and then transcend across the U.S. So why, uh, you know, when we think of of conservation and 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 improving soil health, working with water quality, water quantity. Uh, working with air quality, uh, you know, we, we, we've got to ask ourselves why? Uh, why equity and service? Uh, why this term of parity? Again, parity meaning equity. And, and so when we think about that, uh, let's keep in mind that what we're really talking about is we're talking about equity and service, equity and program delivery, and equity and fund distribution. Uh, and, and, with, and with this, the overarching message of civil rights compliance and conservation program delivery. But I've got to beg the question, and, and, I, and, I, and I urge you to, to really reflect upon this uh, you know, through, throughout your career and, and as you continue to push the effort in the state of California, why? And for the USDA, um, it's, it's, a, it's a history of civil rights uh, lawsuits. Uh, and and it's, it's reminding ourselves of the history of where we've been so that we can then begin to project where we will go. And so with that, you know, we have a history of civil rights lawsuits. Uh, first one, Pickford one, uh, which resulted in $1.6 billion in restitution to black and African-American farmers across the US. Uh, then that was followed by Pickford two, uh, which resulted in 1.25 billion and restitution to black and African-American farmers across the United States. That then continued with Keep Siegel, uh, which provided restitution of 760 million to Native American and Native tribes across the, the United States. And then more recently, uh, between 2011 and 2013, uh, the Women and Hispanic Civil Rights Lawsuit, which resulted in 207 million in restitution to women and Hispanic farmers across the US. So why equity? Why, why striving towards parity in, in conservation program delivery? Well, we most recently heard the Secretary of Agriculture address the state of the black farmer. Uh, we, we also more, uh, more recently in the last couple of months uh, heard about the American Rescue Plan Act, uh, which is gonna provide restitution for socially disadvantaged uh, farmers across the US. However, uh, there's a hold and I urge you to please be patient as these legislative processes do take time. Uh, but as, as we see the USDA leadership moving the effort forward, we see that there's, there's a true passion for making this happen. But why? The taxpayer demands it. 
you know, ultimately we have the charge as, as uh, federal service agencies. And I wanna highlight service agencies that we are uh, acting in the best interest in the investment of the taxpayer dollars. So how? And when you, when you begin to think how, I'm gonna highlight uh, some key phrases here. Let the data drive the strategy. Let the data drive the strategy. And as we begin to let the data drive the, stra the strategy, be intentional with your outreach. Be intentional with your outreach. And as you begin to let the data drive the strategy, we're gonna to begin to see that we are in fact going to be more intentional with our outreach. But as Sonia highlighted at the beginning of the program, we are only as good as the data we collect. And that brings me to a critical point, especially with uh, those that are in the urban sector. As we know, the urban farmer is not yet defined as, as a farmer. So if you're not defined as a farmer, do you exist? Think about it. The urban farmer is not yet counted for in the agricultural statistics service. So if you're not defined as a farmer and you're not counted in the agricultural statistics service, do you exist? Well, here's an, an amazing opportunity, not only for us as conservationists, as agricultural professionals, uh, but as legislative leaders to be a voice for our farmers and ranchers who are, are, are they're our livelihood, right? Without farmers, we do not exist. How can we support this urban sector, right? Because if, if we can't quantify the demographic, we cannot justify the need. And if we cannot quantify the demographic, we cannot justify the need. So just an amazing opportunity, especially in this time as the National Agricultural Statistics Service moves to begin to collect data for the 2022 agricultural census. As we move forward, I urge you to think non-traditional partners. Think non-traditional partners. So, Really quickly, I wanna share with you how here with the Natural Resource Conservation Service, how we begin to look at equity. Now, when we look at equity, what I'm really talking about here is equity in conservation contracting. And so as, as we begin to bridge and to fill the gap, really what we're looking at is how can we work together as partners across our state to help us reach these, these equity factors, right? So how can we improve the engagement in our programs so that the farmer is able to capitalize on their conservation practices? So how do we uh, uh, estimate the state benchmark? As Sonia mentioned, in California, we have just over 77,000 registered farmers. This is per the 2020 agricultural census. In NRCS, we've contracted with about 2,500 of these farmers or 3% of the total farmers in the state. So what does that do? That establishes 3% at the state parity benchmark. Now, we, we, we take a deeper dive and we begin to look at on a county by county basis. So in 2020, uh, there were 61, 000, just over 61,000 registered non-Hispanic white farmers. At the NRCS in California, we contracted with just over 1,900 of these farmers or 3% of the white farming demographic. Now, uh, if there's only 77,000 farmers and there's 61 uh, registered non-Hispanic white farmers, then that becomes the comparative risk. It's the largest demographic in our state. Uh, but what, what, what does this do um, at the county level? It establishes 3% at, as the state parity baseline. Now, there's, there's a PII uh, information that, that I cannot share with you, uh, but what that does then, it begins to break it down by race and ethnicity. And, and, and our goal is then to look at this data and to begin look at, at all the other demographics that, and, and, bring, and begin to work towards bringing them towards that 3% uh, 
right? Because if there's only 14,000 registered uh, Latino farmers, well, there's no way that we can do 2,000 uh, contracts with 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 those or with with those farmers, right? There or the nine the 1,900 contracts with those farmers. So we're we're looking to meet them at the three percent parity baseline. So equity is three percent as far as conservation contracting. Now, how does that look across the state? Here is 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 a map uh, taking that data, and and really what I want to highlight here is. Anything that's in the gray, um, these counties were serving uh, Black or African American farmers at greater than four percent. So, so in those counties, we're, we're we're meeting actually exceeding the parity baseline. And, and if you take a closer look, like for example, Los Angeles is one hundred and seven percent. How is that possible? Well, what that means is there's only maybe two or three registered uh, Black or African American farmers in in that county. Okay, uh, so a, a, a big factor about this is going back to the census and, and creating awareness, right? So not all farmers are registered to the agricultural census. But looking at the red uh, counties here that are highlighted at 0%, what that lets you know is that there are in fact registered Black or African American farmers in these counties who are not yet participating in conservation contracts. So what a huge opportunity for all of us as partners in this collaborative. Now let's take a look at uh, Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish farmers. As you, uh, any, any, and as, as you look at this map, just take a look at anything that's orange, green, or red. So orange, green, or red means that there's registered Latino farmers in these counties. However, they, they, are, they are below the 3% equity baseline uh, that we wanna reach. So in, in, and in some of these counties, uh, one contract will, will, will move them towards the blue, which the blue indicates that we are one for one at 3%. Uh, the gray is that there are, we're, we're exceeding uh, the, the 3% baseline. Now know that because the demographic is much smaller, it's only 14,000 registered Latino farmers compared to just over 60,000 uh, non-Hispanic white farmers. So in some of these counties, uh, one contract makes a huge difference. Now, I also want to bring to the table that um, when, when, we're, when we're talking about equity and service, we are all inclusive. And, and, and I want to stress that uh, because uh, there, there could be a misconception that, that, that now we're not uh, wanting to serve our white farmers. And in fact, this is the demographics for our white farmers. So in, in the orange and in the green and in the red, uh, you can see that there are registered uh, non-Hispanic white farmers. And in fact, and in these counties, we, we can take, make a concerted effort to extend the reach to our non-Hispanic white farmers. Uh, so there is, there's huge opportunity across the board to work together to improve conservation to uh, historically underserved customers, right? And, and as we look at demographics, also think that there's a socioeconomic disparity and, and that that in fact could be part of the reason why these uh, farmers and ranchers are not engaging with our programs. So what, what can you do? Again, when, we, when, we, when, we look, when we're looking at this, we're looking at equity and service, equity in program de delivery, and equity in fund distribution. And if you reflect on the Food Security Act of 1985, also known as the US Farm Bill, you come to find out that there is, there's a local working group mandated uh, by this act. And so here is an opportunity uh, that across the United States, and in fact, we have 58 offices serving the 58 counties in California, that you have an opportunity to engage with your local working group and, and bring your voice, bring your data to the table, right? Because the data that, that the NRCS has, that's one piece of the puzzle. You have another piece of the puzzle. An op here's an opportunity to bring your voice to the table, bring the voice of your community to the table, and bring your data to the table. Again, we are only as good as the data that we have available to us. And that, in fact, is strategic outreach. Uh, we are now working together 
as, as, a, as a collaborative statewide to extend the reach with the concerted effort to historically underserved farmers in historically underserved communities. And when you look at that, when you think, why are they historically underserved? Then we, that's where we begin to think non-traditional partners. So what partners, which, what non-government organizations, which community-based organizations should be at this local working group, regardless if they deal with agriculture? The fact is that we all deal with agriculture. As, as if, if you consume at least one meal a day, we all deal with agriculture. But how can we bring the voice of these historically underserved communities to the table so that you become a pillar of your community, so that the community seeks you out before they decide to make a strategic effort to better serve their, 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 their towns and cities. With that, I want you to save the date. Um, as you know, we, we've been working with the National Center of Appropriate Technology to bring to you the Growing Together Latino Farmer Conference, a, a Spanish program with technical experts who have a Spanish speaking ability and, and keep uh, bringing information, conservation resources to farmers uh, in, in their first language. Uh, also, save the date, the Growing Together Black Farmer Conference with Urban Farmers is scheduled for October 22nd. Now there is gonna be a meet and greet on October 21st, and we're projecting a field visit on October 23rd, which is a Saturday, but the actual conference will be on October 22nd of, of this year. Uh, stay tuned for more information and visit the westfresno.org website for, for updates on the Black Farmer Conference with Urban Farmers. Also, I'm very excited to present to you for the first time a project that we've been working for several years to team up with Southeast Asian partnerships. In, in the coming year, we're gonna be bringing more, more uh, concerted effort to the Southeast Asian communities. Thank you so much. Look forward to continue with the panel and, and answer your questions. Okay, thanks, Victor. Um, now I want to hand it over to Kanok Yisrael to introduce his work um, at Yisrael uh, Family Farm. All right, so um, I'll talk a little bit about um, our work and then kind of go into, uh, you know, uh, why all this is important in, in, in talking about, you know, um, you know, racial justice as it relates to the extension system. Um, first, I want to start out with the land acknowledgement. Um, I'm broadcasting from uh, Stolen Nassinan land, or Nishinan land here in uh, Sacramento, California. And, uh, you know, I'm in between two ancient cities, one called Sama, which is located in uh, what is called present day, you know, Southside Park or, or downtown Sacramento. And then Kadima, which is also close to present day Watt Avenue. And so, uh, these areas here were thriving areas of, 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 of you know, ecological land stewardship, which, you know, I think the first uh, settlers came in probably sometime around the 1800s or so. And then by the time of 1845 or so around there, maybe about 1833, I think closer, 75% um, of that population had been wiped out. And so uh, the reason why that's so important as we start to talk about um, extensions and reaching out is because Many of these same uh, dynamics are still in play today, and as a result, it causes uh, things to happen. But before we get into that a little bit more, let's talk a little bit about uh, myself here. Um, I started out growing food in my backyard probably about 2007, 2008. Um, we live on about a half an acre now, and we use that as an urban farm to, uh, you know, serve ourselves, serve the community. And of course, uh, kind of looking at this, you kind of see these three beds here. Uh, if you notice, wherever I'm supposed to be growing food, there's absolutely nothing growing. Uh, and all of the places around it where I haven't touched anything seem to be the places that have the most lush growth. And the reason why I say that is because I started this type of enterprise without any prior experience. And the reason why I started this without any prior experience is because one, it's not something that I got in school. And two, even though I come from now finding out a farming family, if I go back to great grandparents, 
on both sides, um, I found out that both of them were farmers on, on both of my sides. However, that history was never passed down because it was fraught with a whole bunch of trauma, which I think we'll get into a little bit later. Anyways, needless to say, uh, started to learn some things. The thing that I learned the most was it's best to take care of your soil. So went and took a couple of classes, started to learn some things, and then I went from that uh, to this. Now, of course, you see a little small space in the backyard, but if you can imagine a half an acre, we've expanded that to you know, all different types of things. We do some silviculture. We've got some animals along with some trees. Um, we have a running nursery business. Uh, the food that we grow, what we don't eat, we sell, which we regularly sell out at different markets. And so for the last 10 years or so, um, we've been working at the intersection of ecological land stewardship, sustainable food and agriculture, racial uh, equity and justice, as well as community building and even workforce development. And so that adds to our, or talks about our mission, which is to transform the hood for good and empower the community. And so with that, um, you know, with a single seed, which we started in the ground, no bigger than a period at the end of a sentence, we've become a catalyst in helping to not only rebuild the reputation of what it means to be a black farmer, but also the reputation of our neighborhood, which is called South Oak Park, as a place where there's more going on than just poverty and crime. Um, and so with that, um, we do a few different things. Uh, here we go. Um, we're growing food. Um, of course, uh, these are some of the some of the things that we do growing food. Um, I work around work with many young people in the community. We have farm stands, we have you picks. I work with people in the community to make sure um, young people specifically, because most of the young people have no idea that this is an actual uh, career path that they can even take of course growing up in the cities disconnected from food. In addition to that, we also have a program where we actually help people establish gardens. And the thing is, is that we look at gardening as like a gateway drug, right? They have a third of an acre, right? And they've never grown anything in their life. And we've had some people who, by starting out, learning how to garden and grow a few things in their backyard, they've now turned their backyards into urban farms and they're now doing similar things that we've done. So that's one of the things that we do as far as growing food. Um, we also reach out to the local schools. And so this is one of the things that we did there. And, and what I think is so good about this is that if you can get children to drink a smoothie after you put kale in it um, and they're smiling at the same time, I look at that as a big success, right? And so also we have things to where in this particular case, we're doing a honey harvest. We pulled some frames out and those frames, the children were able to kind of stick their fingers in and eat honey. And so this whole idea is to kind of bridge the gap between uh, people who would never even know how agriculture takes place, never even seen a tomato, know that it comes off of a plant, those types of things. Um, as well as, okay, honey, there are such things as bees and that's what makes our honey too as well. In addition to that, we've also had to get involved politically um, in our city because after we did our work and we decided, yeah, we've got enough food to maybe be able to sell some of this food now, we realized it was totally illegal to do so um, after calling around to the you know, uh, local government saying, hey, we wanna be able to grow our food, what do we do? They say, well, you can't. So anyways, we got together with some folks and we um, helped to pass an ordinance which makes it legal to grow and sell food in the Sacramento City and Sacramento County. Uh, so that's how we grow a community. In addition to that, we're also growing people. Um, this young lady here, she was so uh, excited about this kale here because uh, especially it was called dinosaur or dino kale. She loved touching it. But one thing is very important because uh, if, it's one thing to grow the food, but it's another thing to be able to cook the food, to prepare the food. And when you talk about a community like mine, it's fraught with, uh, you know, fast food restaurants, uh, you know, empty lots, as well as corner stores where there's no vegetables. And so being able to kind of recreate this pipeline that in other communities is still there from farmer to, you know, grocery store, and then ultimately to uh, the plate. Um, another program that we have is Project Good. Good is an acronym for Growing Our Own Destiny. And what we do with that pro, what we do with that is we uh, make sure that we can 
reach out to youth and we spend the, the summer with them talking about everything from planting seeds to harvesting to uh, we actually put a garden in their backyard of wine barrels and then we teach them how to take care of them. In fact, it was something that we had to do via COVID uh, because of the simple fact that, uh, you know, we couldn't go and see people. So we put the gardens in their backyard and then over Zoom, we actually taught them how to take care of those gardens. But then what came up is that, well, I don't wanna learn how to grow food because that's something that my ancestors did and because they were oppressed, um, I don't think that that's something for me. So there are some barriers specifically um, that we have to overcome in, in getting people to actually want to grow their food. And that's where the extension, I believe, comes in. And here's some more, some more things here. She's uh, stirring some food and she's uh, real happy. In fact, they're so hungry that, uh, you know, they were, they're getting her to try to stir that food. In addition to that, we're also growing the planet. Uh, we try to create a closed system. We're very close. I would say about 75 to 80 percent closed system, which means that the things that go into the ground here are also created here. So we've had to come up with our own composting system. Of course, we use the manure from the chickens. Uh, they fertilize our orchard area. Um, of course, we do this with worms. We don't have enough space for a cow, uh, but we are able to kind of create that give and take relationship with the earth that is absolutely necessary for um, anything fruitful to take place. Um, we also do have bees. And of course, even our neighbors like us now because the first week they saw us coming in with beehives, they were like, I don't wanna get stung by bees and those types of things. But then I was like, well, you do know that bees pollinate your fruit trees, right? And uh, you know, if we have these bees here, you're more likely gonna have better fruit and bigger fruit. And so that's happened. And so they're happy about us being here now. Um, and last but not least, like I said before, we have chickens. Um, and those chickens are located in our main orchard area. So they have a nice little relationship with each other there. In addition to that, we're also uh, profiting. Uh, because in teaching classes, many of which are free, um, we do have some classes that are more advanced that require more time and we do charge for those classes. Um, in addition to that, we have a full line of products. Many of the products are made from, so value added uh, products that are made from things that we grow here on the farm. And of course, all of the food that we do have left over to grow is um, bought at different markets. And so in reality, what we're talking about doing is starting a revolution and not just a business. Uh, because like I said before, in order to kind of bridge this gap, people need to see examples of these things happening. And so uh, one of the reasons, in my opinion, why we don't have more farmers of color, especially black farmers, is because there's no way to see them anywhere. And, the, and of course, there are some that, you know, we have, especially in this area, you go down into the Central Valley, you're going to find more, as you saw with Victor Slides. But up here, Sacramento, those areas, you don't see them. So in seeing them, we've even had peop uh, young people actually start to think about, hey, what would it be like to be able to become a farmer? And what are the next steps for me to take? And so what we invite people to do as we invite people to uh, get involved and start their own revelation, uh, their own revolution. And we do this because if you remember, and I'm not old enough, but maybe some of you are old enough to remember that uh, in 1944, 20 million gardeners grew 40% of the nation's fresh vegetables from backyards, empty lots, and all different types of places. And so that's the work that we're doing in the community. However, uh, just recently, uh, my wife and I, Judith, pictured there, uh, we've been blessed to be able to now be able to expand because we've just bought some land in uh, uh, Amador County. And so I've had the, uh, the pleasure of meeting with one of our extension agents. I think she might be on the call, Lynn, if you're there. Uh, very good to meet you. And she's been very helpful in helping us start to navigate the things that we need uh, to bring our enterprise on, on online. And so uh, with that, um, just wanted to say that that's what we do there. But also, it's very important to understand that with that, we've had to move and start some other things within the state. And that's where uh, the California Farmer Justice Collaborative comes in. And, and so with the California uh, Farmer Justice Collaborative, um, one of the things that, that, it, that it's done, and it came out, this is a... a the California Farmer Justice Collaborative, we got together because we realized that even though we're all working in these different places locally, 
um, we still need to figure out how this is going to work in the state level. Because, of course, everything starts from federal, state, and then comes down into the communities. And lots of time, we're trying to fight to get up, and then we have that pressure pushing down on us. So we came up to the state, and in 2017, we were able to get um, an act passed called the Farmer Equity Act. Now, the Farmer Equity Act is basically, one, it helps to redefine uh, what we call underserved farmers and ranchers of color. And so it defines, socially dis uh, it defines a socially disadvantaged farmer as uh, someone who has been subjected to racial, ethnic, or gender prejudice because of their identities um, of a group um, without regard to their individual qualities. And so when we think about those, we think about African-Americans, Native Americans, Alaskan Natives, Hispanics, uh, Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. And so we wanted to make it real specific um, because, you know, as we've seen lately, when we were talking, it, at first it was, we wanted to maybe do minorities. But then once we did minorities, uh, there were white farmers um, women, uh, white women farmers who then, well then, okay, we're gonna go ahead and get into that. And we got a little bit of pushback behind that. So we had to make it very, very specific to make sure that the people who we wanted to serve were served. And so what the Farmer Equity Act does is it, it's a California law that opens up the platform uh, uh, surrounding farmer equity. And it also holds the CDFA accountable for serving the needs of farmers of color. And it also will make access to grants, resources, decision-making power, et cetera, more accessible to underserved farmers and ranchers of color. And so there's a few different um, key players that were in that. And I think we'll probably start, up, start to talk about that as we get into the, uh, you know, the meat of our conversation. But I just wanted to share that um, so you can get an idea of where our work started on the ground and then how it's now um, expanding into uh, larger farms, as well as expanding into statewide representation. Um, so thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for um, UC Syrup for having me here. And um, I'll turn it over to the next person. Okay. Um, so the next uh, panelist to introduce themselves, Kristen Leach of Namu Farms and Second Generation Seeds. Um, so Kristen, take it away. Hi, and I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have photos. My internet is a little um, unstable today, and so I didn't want to risk it. Um, but my name's Kristen, and I farm in Winters, and I lease uh, about six acres from uh, Mike and Diane Madison. And then I also uh, work with them uh, with all the irrigation on some of the space. Um, and I mostly got into this from working on other farms um, and had just gotten the opportunity to contract to grow different types of Asian vegetables uh, when I was younger. Um, and so just kind of one thing led to another and then was able to start my own farm business. So I uh, became a you know, sole proprietor sort of accidentally just because the opportunities presented themselves. Um, and now I also do field trials for different seed companies and do commercial seed contracting, um, as well as uh, what Stephanie mentioned, which is uh, facilitate a, a farmer's collaborative called Second Generation, which is focused on really preserving and adapting uh, Asian crop varieties uh, for different regional suitability, as well as just to endure the kind of unraveling climate chaos as we're facing it. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, when I started my farm, probably the main driver, um, as Kanoka has spoken to so much, has just been to really build community. And for me, I was really concerned. I was born in Korea. Um, I was really interested in preserving the sort of agricultural knowledge that I knew all of my ancestors had. And I saw it under threat just because of... Uh, the situation Korea has been in since the 80s in terms of all of this restructuring and debt from the International Monetary Fund and World Bank. And so I think Korea stands as an example um, in the context of lots of other places globally that has faced kind of the export of certain types of um, mentality and approaches to agriculture through the Green Revolution and other uh, well-meaning agricultural development. But those 
uh, types of expertise and that real kind of worldview and cosmology about our relationship to land and seed and plants uh, has really dispossessed a lot of small farmers and peasants of land in places like Korea and other parts of the global south. Um, and it just makes these small farmers distrust our own knowledge and knowledge that's existed for centuries um, before the kind of current iteration of agriculture that we're situated within right now. And so that was really the big thing for me was knowing that a lot of the older farmers that I turned to, you know, just said, you should be able to feed yourself and your family with just a sickle and a hoe. Uh, all your fertility, you know, like the world is generous and it's there for you. Um, and to just approach our job as farmers with that same generosity of like what we want to give back and what we want to reciprocate to our ecosystems, instead of just seeing it as everything that we could stand to take. Uh, and so that's been a lot of the real focus. And I think part of what hopefully will be part of our conversations is just, um, you know, the kind of the danger of um, perceived expertise, whose knowledge is respected and listened to and just seen uh, and validated. Um, and, you know, really whose work and contributions, whose labor and land and resources is, uh, has helped build the type of economy that uh, we have in California, thanks to agriculture and in the US uh, and just globally, you know, like who's sustaining the work of preserving biodiversity um, and these really kind of amazing, sophisticated and elegant uh, agroecological uh, systems that, you know, we don't know, but often legitimized through the kind of like scientific language and perspectives that are seen as, uh, you know, as seen as being really technically proficient, but, uh, you know, in many ways, they're more dynamic and more resilient than the things that we're, you know, perpetuating right now. Uh, so that's all I'll say is an introduction to my farm. And thanks for having me. Thanks, Kristen. Um, okay, so with that, I think we'll begin the panel discussion and Q&A. Uh, we did get some questions from our registration form. And so I think I will ask some of those first. Um, one of the questions is, what examples can you give of extension professionals supporting farmers of color to start ag enterprises in places where currently there are few or none? What would you say to extension professionals who say, but there are no farmers of color in my service area? And I can put that in the chat because that's a long question here. Kristen, would you like well, to start that? Oh, whoops, <laughs> never mind. I was gonna say that, you know, I think that Victor kind of hit that point and I think we probably need to beat it until it can't move anymore, um, which is really to reach out because it's not that there's sometimes that they're not there and we find this out in the city a lot is that it's not that there's not people there, it's that you just don't know them. And then you don't know the people that know them. So once again, we're talking about building partnerships with community-based organizations, um, such as the CFJC, California Farmer Justice Collaborative, because we know where all the farmers are in the state. Uh, and we've, you know, done a lot of research, you know, the, the, um, at the same time, the, um, the Farmer Equity Act, there was a, a big thing that they came out with, a, a state of how, you know, who's doing farming in, 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 in uh, California. So I think that those are the main things that get the people who are already working with the farmers because they know where they are. And it's funny, many times they could be right under your nose. And in many times, because of lack of land tenure and those types of things, they can't just go and fill out the census in the same type of way. That's for a farm owner to do. So if they're a farm worker or what have you, um, then they can't do that as readily. So making, making partnerships with community-based organizations is the key to do that. Absolutely. And just to uh, add to uh, Canuck's uh, message here, you know, the local working group is just an amazing opportunity to get your voice on the table. And, you know, like I said, working as a collaborative across the state, right, to not only bring your voice to the table, but bring your data in, to the table, because a lot of times uh, your organizations uh, are able to do much more with data gathering than, than what we are as, as, a, as a federal entity. And so, you know, working together, uh, I think it just, that that's what's going to make us, uh, allow us to move much forward and I mean, these farmers. And I also wanted to add, because like, for example, uh, 
when we when we launched the Black Farmer Conference with Urban Farmers in West Fresno with Ms. Ms. Yolanda Randles uh, back in uh, 2016, 2017, we had we, we were below the parity baseline uh, with serving uh, uh, black farmers in the state. And in fact, at that conference, uh, we, ha we had a unique story that our, our district conservationist in Hollister was able to connect with one of her farmers there that she, that she had never met before. Right. And, and through that farmer, then the farmer to farmer network and the word of mouth uh, grew. And, and as, a as, as a result, uh, we're currently serving uh, Black and, and African-American farmers at 4%. So just above the parity baseline. Now, that doesn't mean that we stop the work there. As you've seen the map, uh, there's a huge amount of opportunity, uh, but the demographics are small. Uh, and you know what we found at that conference, because we, we did team up with the National Agricultural Statistics Service, and uh, we asked the question, uh, who here is registered in the, in the ag census? And no one raised their hand. And, and then so we said, who here is not registered with the ag census? Everyone raised their hand. And so that, that just goes, just educating and creating awareness. And you know, I'm, I'm gonna segue into another question that came up on my side about uh, the ag census and how we can work uh, closer with these farmers. And, you know, the key is educating and creating awareness, right? Because when we're looking at uh, obtaining funds and, and being able to support our communities, it, 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 it's, it's like the urban farmer. If, if, if you're not counted, if, if we can't uh, measure the demographic, then we can't justify the resources. And, and, and I think when you bring that message to the table that, hey, it, it by not registering, but then engaging with the program, you're actually taking funds away from a farmer that did register. And so you end up doing a disservice to your community. And so the, the, the best, you know, just by be creating that awareness that we can begin to move our, our uh, people across the state to, to register uh, in the ag census and be counted. Because at the end of the day, the, the data uh, justifies the means, right? So if we can quantify the demographic, then we can begin to justify the need. Yeah, I mean, I think what Victor said, it brings up just this sort of chicken and egg conundrum of just like, you need the data to justify where the money is gonna go to, but you know, realistically, like people need to see some real structural change to earn any amount of trust to work with agencies like Co-op Extension or SEREP and all the other acronyms that there are out there just because there's been historically like, just a complete breach of that trust and real violence directed towards a lot of these communities. And so I think, um, you know, I understand like that, that data really needs to be there for you all to justify and have a compelling sort of narrative to give back to all the agencies that you're accountable to. Um, but just to say what Victor and Kanok both have said is just like collaboration is really key. Um, and I think it's just about also looking at how much we're looking to kind of you know, centralize those resources and saying, you know, like I think a lot of people think access is just about like keeping the door open or telling people they're welcome to walk through the door, but it's really about the structural integrity of like the whole blueprint. And I think when so many of our systems have been designed to really actively dispossess, you know, black and indigenous and communities of color, uh, we can't just, you know, flip a switch and say, well, now we're letting you in here uh, without really addressing kind of like the cornerstone that that whole you know, economy was built on. And so I think the more you can kind of outsource um, those resources and redistribute it, and the more that these kinds of agencies can act as a conduit to not only um, build relationships, but like build trust through like uh, redistributing actual resources and capital, just because technical assistance is just really the tip of the iceberg in terms of what really helps farmers be resilient. And that's where so much money kind of goes to in terms of especially supporting beginning farmers and ranchers and socially disadvantaged farmers. But realistically, there's a host of so many other levers um, just about like land access and security and tenure, just affordable cost of living, um, lending and access to capital. And all of those things are actually much bigger burdens to bear for most communities of color than not having the knowledge of how to grow the crops that we want to grow and not knowing how to be adaptive and nimble in the face of climate change. And so just to say, like, we focus on like the, um, the sharing of this knowledge or trying to teach communities like how to kind of grow things better. But really, like, it's about the broader landscape of lots of different things that are actively keeping communities disenfranchised. Um, so I think, yeah, beyond just sort of, um, 
you know, building that trust and, and working with different community partners, uh, the more you can send some of those resources in and let those communities do it in a way that lets them be autonomous, will earn that trust because it's not saying like we have this ask where we're ultimately going to still continually benefit from the work and labor and wisdom that you all have in your community. It's saying do the work, do the work that you've always been doing, and we're just going to find ways of actually compensating you for it where historically you haven't been compensated. Thank you all. That was so thorough. I uh, appreciate Also, another, that. another thing I'd like to ask, and this is just something I want to ask Victor, is like, when is the, uh, when, when is the survey due, usually? I believe the next one is coming out for 2022. And so, okay. you know, this, this is... A, and you know we've been talking about the urban demographics since uh, back in 2016 when we were getting ready for the what was going to be the 2018 uh, ag census. It, en it ends up coming out in 2020. Um, you what know, month? so it, it, it's in what time of the year? You know, I, I don't have the exact month. Okay. Uh, but you know, um, come come to the Black Farmer Conference with Urban Farmers with uh, Yolanda Randles because you know we want to invite uh, National Agricultural Statistics Service leadership here in California to to participate. And you know maybe that's a good opportunity to get them a, a speakership opportunity so they can uh, you know help us create that awareness. You know the main thing is that it, it's a regional office. Uh, you know the the ag census was originally done by the I believe the Department of of Interior um, and 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 then it, it was then eventually adopted over to USDA. Uh, so you know there's there's a huge uh, gap right because if you see the census people now what do they do? Well they split up the town into uh, quadrants. And then you have individuals going and knocking door to door. And our, we don't do that in, in the ag census. You know, we, we really highly rely on social media, on other media outlets and, and, and people like, like us, right, in, in, our, in our organizations to be able to, you know, share the news and, and really then, you know, go visit your local service center so you can get that, you know, fill out the application. So you got to send the registration to the, to, to the Agricultural Statistics Service. Then they assign an, an identification number and then now you will be then able to receive the ag census. So it is it is a process, right? And so um, you know all we can do at this point is really just uh, educate, create awareness, uh, and and help to spread the word wherever possible. And we do have a follow up question regarding the census in the Q and A. Um, the question is, what is NRCS and the USDA currently doing to build trust with communities of color? As many folks don't want any anything to do with the census subject matter or working, or they don't want to work with the state due to the long history of past and current wrongs. That's an excellent question. And you know, as as when we look at um, cultural backgrounds and and really reflect on you know where 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 do our people come from, right? We uh, many of us that are considered uh, socially disadvantaged or historically underserved, and I count myself because. This is why I love this this Alba uh, mural behind me because uh, that's my family. Yeah, you know, they got my back. They're right there. You know, and it's a constant reminder to me uh, where I come from. And um, a lot of times, our peoples come from oppressive governments. And so, when you come to the United States and you begin to uh, build your life here, uh, it to go and engage with the federal government is not the first knee jerk reaction, right? And so, really, um, you got to remember that culture trumps strategy. Now, many times we think that because we got a press release and we're communicating with media sources that farmers and ranchers are going to get the information, but no, that's not true. As a matter of fact, it's uh, the farmer to farmer network and the word of mouth really that, that, that is still the number one uh, way to reach farmers. And, and how, does, how does that work? It, it starts with you, it, with, with outstanding service uh, beyond what's required, you know, because we, we come and find out that you know, there's, there's, uh, we have really good farmers, but, but there's a, a lack of business acumen, or, uh, you know, we maybe we're, we're not really in tune with forms and, and filling out applications. And so, really, does take the technical um, assistance with, you know, let's, let's sit down and let me see, okay, tell me your name and, and, and let's, let's do it together, right? Let's walk through this process together. But guess what happens in that interaction? Uh, we begin to develop a relationship. And, and, and when, when it comes to, uh, uh, you know, the bottom line, it, it, it takes relationship building. And, you know, I got to say that with, with the outreach we do, you know, we have the Latino Farmer Conference, we have the Black Farmer Conference with Urban Farmers. Those are, those are tools, 
those are tools in our toolbox, right? But you get the job done, right? Our boots on the ground, the soil conservationists, the district conservationists, the, the technical experts, the agronomists, the engineers, you that are in the field, you get the job done, uh, you know, because at the end of the day, it's your relationships that you build with your farmers and your community, and, and, and then that you extend that invitation. That, that's what brings farmers to, the, to these conferences, you know, because I, I can be out here, you know, I'm over here in Davis. I, I, I can be announcing and putting things out in, in social media, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's the, the relationship that's built at the field level and that, that one on one interaction. It also just is important too that like as a as a governmental agency like there's an explicit articulation that helps build that trust like especially when you're working with like immigrant and refugee communities like and we know that ICE has had like tons of different covert ways to like invite people to these things like take a census enroll it for healthcare like all of these things that seem fairly innocuous and we're doing this outreach for but are just ways to essentially deport people or contain them and you know like so there's very legitimate, scary reasons why people do not want to come to these types of uh, events. They don't want to be registered um, because it really is a bait and switch a lot of times. And so I think that that's also really important to think about. Yeah, what Victor said, like farmers and farm workers, we're like feeding the world, right? And it's our boots on the ground that has that knowledge of how to like keep feeding people in the face of like all of this anarchy that's happening. Um, so if you care about that, like it also demands a little bit of accountability to like these other bigger things that aren't seen as uh, just the physical sciences of just what we think about in agriculture, um, but are also equally dependent in terms of just like, yeah, really making these strong statements of, of standing up for immigrants and, and being protective of keeping families together and things like that. Because if we're not doing that, there's really no reason that people and families should trust our agencies, you know, there's just, it's just one other part of the government that could be, you know, misleading you uh, with really dire consequences. So just to say, you know, I really understand and why people are so hesitant and that it's not just about kind of words, uh, words aren't just the only avenue to get people to trust that. So as you begin to reflect as how can we engage with these communities, you know, and, 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 and really look at the cultural factor, it's like, okay, so where, 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 do, where, where do our farmers get their, their information from? Because we, we really what's happening is our communities are siloed, just as our organizations have been siloed for many years, right? We tend to work with only our, our research group. And, and then, so then we're looking to, well, who can we share this information with, right? And so you think about usually, um, you know, we'll tend to go to our most educated family member, right? Uh, you know, the, the, you know, ask uh, Kristen, she went to college, you know, ask Canuck, you know, he, 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 he went to the incubator program over at Alba, you know, and, you know, so that's uh, what, what your farmers, especially the older generation are going to tend to go to uh, the educated family member. And, but then think about where do they share that information and how can we, as agricultural professionals help bridge relationships and communities. Now, I know it's far reaching, but bear with me. But working with a, with, with a, a community-based organization that serves, for example, the Latino community, you know, regardless of, of what, you know, that regardless of it has to do with agriculture or not, the fact is that uh, when a family member goes to, to, to that uh, service center to obtain the, the services in the community, that if our information is there a handout or, or that if, if we have an opportunity to just um, give a brief overview of who we are and what we're doing. Hey, come talk to me if you need more information. Well, guess what? Now you've given somebody in the community uh, an inf uh, some information to take back to the barbecue, right? And, and now you're helping, now you're bridging relationships, right? Because uh, you, maybe um, I had nothing that I could relate with with my uncle or with my aunt. And, but now I say, oh, but you know, my aunt is a, is a farmer. Hey, had you heard about this Latino farmer conference? It, you know, now we're fostering relationships and that's what we're talking about with joining the local working group and becoming a pillar in your community because you, you will become such a respected uh, resource in your community that, uh, you know, you're going to want, the, your community is going to want you to be there before they make a decision. Anything that has to do with food, food security, food justice, 
and 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 with uh, you know keeping uh, your your community healthy. Knok, would you like to expand on it on the question, or would, should I move on to the next question? Uh, I was just going to say also, just yeah, just um, um, it's a great thing to be able to to, to kind of think about that, but. I think the, the main thing that I was gonna say is that um, uh, I know for myself is that when, like for example, when, when farmers, now that I know, you know, there's people that are farming in, in Sacramento, when those farmers, re, when somebody contacts them about something, they'll usually contact me um, and be like, hey, do you know about this? Do you know about that? Do you know about this? And I think it's just, you know, just going back to that whole, you have to find that person. And so just to kind of use a farm analogy just quickly, um, we've got this ground, which is the, the farmers of color who have been neglected for, for a long period of time. It's not just gonna be as simple as just throwing some seeds and it's gonna, things are gonna come up. You're gonna have to do more. That means you gotta get out and do much more than you would do for any other community. And I think that that's what we, I think that's what I wanna drive home is that there's gonna have to be more done. You know, it's not just gonna be, I'm gonna sit in my office and make phone calls. You gotta go out and talk to people. And, and build those relationships, so. Yeah, um, I think this relates to the previous question. It, it also came in through the registration form. The question is, uh, what organizations should we connect with to better support farmers and farm workers of color? Um, I know CFJC is one. Um, I know that there's also a, a, an organization called Minnow um, that's also, uh, um, my, she does minnow and they work with, um, Asian farmers. Um, and those are the two that I know. Um, but the thing is, is that within those two, they're probably, we're connected to other, other people too. So it's more like, okay, you get in contact with somebody and say, Hey, I'm looking for this particular place. You're like, let's thumb through the, thumb through the banks here. Okay. We got this person we can connect you with. So I think that those, those are good starts. For, for what you're looking for. You know, we also mentioned the uh, think non-traditional and, you know, think, you know, think, think about farmers as business owners, because if you're a farmer, you're a business owner and uh, farmers. farmers are entrepreneurs, you know, so as, as business owners and entrepreneurs, uh, you know, a lot of times what we find out is that the, the biggest, uh, uh, knowledge gap for farmers, uh, well-experienced farmers is business acumen, right? And so uh, beginning to uh, reframe who the farmer is, right? That if it, if it says business or resources, or it says entrepreneurial resources, that that's a workshop that we want our farmers to attend to because we must help support farmers to develop viable business models so that they can continue to farm and do the good work that they do, right? And, and many times that, that's, that's, that's the, the, the challenge in itself, right? That um, until we can keep farmers farming through viable business models, then we can uh, move into addressing resource concerns, right? So uh, just, I think when we look at that, you know, that if, if, we can, if we can help facilitate that, that that goes a long way, but also, you know, think of your chambers of commerce, you know, your chamber of commerce is, is, is a central point usually tied to the, the mayor of the town uh, but all of the local businesses convene here on a monthly basis to uh, network, 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 right? And, you know, what better way to um, not only obtain business resources, but also to make business connections uh, for market placement. You know, your local restaurants go there, your local school districts go there, farm to school. Uh, you know, so, so there's uh, unique opportunities that happen when, within the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, but not only the, the Chambers of Commerce, you know, you have the the, the Black Chamber of Commerce, you have the uh, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, uh, you have organizations like the Asian Business Institute and Resource Center, you have the Mi Minority Business Development Agency, you have the CDFIs, uh, which are nonprofit, um, basically for access to capital, like California FarmLink. Uh, you know, so you, you have a, a huge array of resources, it's just a matter of reframing, uh, you know, the mindset that if, if, if there's a workshop and it doesn't say agriculture or farmers, no, if it says business or entrepreneur resources, that's you, uh, right? That and, and helping facilitate that so that you know we can keep farmers farming and helping them stay viable in, in, in this uh, you know this business that 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 really is has so many variables. Uh, 
I also know that uh, there was a survey done by uh, CAF, California Alliance for Family Farmers. They did a survey of farmers of color uh, in the state first. I don't know, remember exactly what it was all for, but they did do a survey. So they had to go and talk to a bunch of people too as well. So, you know, they, I'm sure that they, I don't know how they would go about releasing those records or getting people in contact, but they're there, they've done it. I'm sure they have data, so. And I'll just plug uh, California FarmLink just because they help bridge a lot of uh, the gap in terms of just like lending and capital and really supporting um, folks that just don't qualify for traditional lending, which I think just at the right time, uh, yeah, an operating loan or land loan can be really substantial. Um, and then Kitchen Table Advisors does a lot of what Victor had just mentioned, which is just to provide that business acumen. And so they're not going to step in um, with some of the you know, growing expertise and things like that. And so I think for any other, uh, you know, NRCS or co-op extension that is going to focus more on that, working with someone like KTA is a great match just because together you could kind of supplement both the agronomic part of it and then just the kind of business entrepreneur side of it. Um, and I think, you know, to Victor's point too, like I think a lot of um, who we can look to are just the... Um, external facing parts of those market channels. And so just thinking about where farmers are wanting to, you know, bring their food, what are the avenues they have to sell their produce um, and thinking how to strengthen it. Because I know, um, you know, co-op extension in Fresno had done a lot of things around marketing Asian vegetables to support Southeast Asian farmers there. And I think it was just a really great example of not, you know, using co-op extension or these avenues to kind of help farmers become literate in a very sort of particular iteration of American capitalism, but rather just saying, oh, these are the crops you love. These are the crops you wanna grow. This is the crops that you grow on the side, no matter what, to feed your family and community. So how can we actually just bolster um, the market end of it to meet the things that you're really competent in growing rather than developing these strategies just to get immigrants to grow, you know, just lettuce and strawberries like everyone else. Um, so I think, yeah, working collaboratively with other small businesses and things can create like lots of really nice synergies that are just, you know, it's just going to be that thing where the seed planted today just means like in the long term, uh, those relationships get to flourish. And so the investment made by agencies like ones present here just gives, yeah, all of those other communities room to be growing and flourishing and be kind of more autonomous than just constantly kind of coming back for aid and support. Okay, thank you all. Um, I think I'm gonna move on to another question. Um, we have a couple questions here in the chat. Um, one is besides grants and besides changing policies, I'm not sure how that applies. Um, what are one to three things that cities and or counties can do to support urban farmers? Uh, what are th the things that can make it easier for the next urban farmers to get started? And what are struggles you went through that changes in city or county activities or programs could have made easier for the next generation of diverse farmers? It's kind of a lot there, but. Mm -hmm. um, let's see here. Um, well, I think the, the main thing for urban farmers is really uh, customers, uh, people. Cause I mean, when we first started growing food we got laughed at by everybody in any type of organization. Like, oh, you've only got a half an acre. You're not, you're not, you're not farming that type of thing. So it's really like, <laughs> it's almost like really moral support, <laughs> you know, in, in those types of things. And, and, and really just then, of course, you're, you're usually, and this is not always what happens, but in many times you're talking about um, somebody who like myself has no prior experience, but then now you're, you're, you're trying to run this enterprise and you've got your hands in the soil all the time, but then not knowing where the resources are. Where are the resources? Who has the resources? Where can I learn more? Um, you know, when, when we first started, I did not have access to any of what I have access to now. So now urban farmers that I do meet or people that talk about it, I'm able to say, you go here, go here, talk to these people, try this, try that. So it's really like having things in a place to where, okay, 
uh, where do you go? You know, how do you develop your enterprise? The same thing about business information, all, the, all those different things, or those are the things that urban, urban farmers need. Um, but at the same time, like I said, it's, it's really just um, like support to say, okay, I see what you're doing. Uh, you may not be doing a whole bunch now, but I know you'll get there. And here, let me show you how to get there. Let me help you blaze a path. Yeah, I think infrastructure is really important too, just because especially I think if you're urban or peri-urban and most likely, yeah, leasing a plot of land where you don't live, um, just basic things like having electricity on the site uh, really matters and you probably don't have it. Uh, and so then also just things that are pretty essential for any small farm operation, like cold storage, um, you know, just ways to kind of hold over your harvest, uh, I think are really meaningful things that could probably be built out and shared. Um, so creating more kind of hubs. I think the infrastructure piece is probably just like one of the biggest things in terms of just creating any sort of efficiency for a small farm operation. And yeah, I think in, in our cities, like you just lack the ability to really do that. If you're on a quarter acre, you can't take, uh, you know, 800 square feet out of production to put in a cooler and a wash station and things like that. Um, so yeah, shared infrastructure um, and help with, you know, probably distribution. Food safety information too, as well. Um, I remember one time, uh, you know, I was, I had if somebody wanted to buy some produce. It was a local school. And then they started to come in and started talking about gap. And I'm like, I mean, are you talking about in between the rows or what are you talking about? You know? And so, you know, just really having that type of information um, so that, you know, you, you know, what kind of things you're getting into. Just to add to the, to the idea here, you know, uh, with meeting with urban farmers across the state, you know, a lot of times what we find is that, you know, you're, you're dealing with a, a, a an inner city park, a quarter acre of an inner city park or a, a container operation or, you know, uh, working in a confined space. And so a lot of times when it comes to making that decision, well, for one, uh, you know, not being recognized as a farmer, right? And, and, and realizing that um, as, 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 a, as a farmer, you, you've, you've got to find a way to create a viable business model. And so having, you know, that, that local urban uh, organization having to really um, transform into a nonprofit organization and then uh, with the coordinated effort maybe with the local school district or with uh, you know working on a city or county grants or state grants uh, you know and, and that's why I highlight you know it's so it's so important that if, if you know working together to just define you know create a definition to define the urban farm as a farmer but you know having this definition be broad enough to encompass the, the the variety and the diversity of urban operations, right? And, and then moving towards uh, having uh, urban farmers integrated into the agricultural census so that we can quantify the demographic. Uh, you know, a lot of times uh, urban farmers, uh, what I found, and this is a, you know, this is not what I what I say, this is, this is what, I've, what I've listened to um, with meeting with, with uh, organizations in, in California is that, you know, not being, uh, identified as a farmer, uh, per, you know, really limits uh, when, when uh, a request for proposals from like uh, uh, the USDA come out, right? So not, not being able to identify um, the, uh, yourself with, with the farming organization because I'm not defined as a farmer. Um, having to make the tough decision whether hiring a grant writer to, to uh, apply for a grant that's going to keep your organization open for the rest of the year versus uh, hiring someone to uh, apply for a conservation contract, right? So there's, you know, th those, I think those, those are some, some of the limiting challenges, but so, some of the things that, that we can do together, like uh, Rob Benetton, uh, I know who asked the question, he's been working in the urban epicenter for a long time, uh, you know, being able to identify um, what are the resource concerns that urban farmers uh, are currently uh, engaging with and, 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 and being able then to align those to some of our programs so that uh, we can you know, essentially uh, put money back, back in the farmer's pocket, right? Because that's, those, that's, that's what in federal incentive programs do, right? That the farmer is going to um, implement the conservation practice and the incentive is that then they would then uh, are going to rate a, a certain level of reimbursement for adapting the conservation practice. Uh, but, you know, none of this happens until we define the urban farmer as a farmer and, and we quantify the farmer in the ag census. Those two things, uh, I think, you know, 
changes the whole game for, for the urban center. Uh, you know, not to mention the, the partnerships, right? I mean, it's, it's such an intricate uh, network of partners uh, that it takes in the community from uh, faith-based organizations to school districts, to city councils. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's really, it, it's a village, right? It's, it's a village working together to, to change uh, the narrative at the local level. Okay, we're getting a little bit close to three o'clock. I'm gonna try and ask two more questions before we close out. Um, so one question that we that I wanted to ask um, that we had that we think would be important to address is what would you like to see from extension agencies and organizations uh, in terms of moving towards a, having a more diverse workforce? Why is that an important aspect of improving services for farmers of color? And what changes do you think would work toward that goal? I mean, the common theme here is just about building trust. And I think that, um, you know, it's that idea. It's not just sort of the representation of only seeing someone that looks like you. It's also someone that probably can relate to where you're coming from, someone that maybe has similar values or just like ways of other ways of relating. And I think building those relationships and being able to make that kind of small talk and knowing kind of like, you know, maybe even having overlap in those communities um, really does go a long way. And so I think, and I know for me, like, you know, there's been times where people have shown me job descriptions at something like co-op extension to advise on things like Asian crop production. But because I only have a high school level of science education, like you're just immediately disqualified. And so I think just like revisiting like what we value in terms of those jobs. And, you know, I know that might just be an immovable piece because of all the bureaucracy that you all are exposed to. Um, but I do think that when you look at a job description and you see, you know, Asian crop specialist only required qualification as a master's degree, and then somewhere down the long list of, you know, sort of secondary desired recommended things is, you know, some knowledge of Asian crops or communities, you know, that just says a lot in terms of just what has weight in terms of just like what's being valued. And I think that that just needs to shift a little bit to just like really have people, uh, you know, just bringing the diversity of those perspectives and not just kind of, you know, from one kind of pipeline of, of what's legitimate knowledge. Um, and so I think that's just one thing that I know just from personal experience feels a little bit stifling and makes me not want to reach out because I'm like, well, if I just know mostly what people just want is a, a couple letters after your name and it doesn't matter where you're coming from or what your life experience is, you know, how much can I really relate to that? Yeah, and I think that that's, um, you know, be willing to understand and confront those things. I mean, because, you know, I've, I've run into that too. There's a couple of times where I've seen the same thing and it's like, uh, y'all have to, if y'all want to do this, then you will have to raise your voices about some of these things and say, I mean, because the fact that you have to have a master's degree to go and do something like that, it's part of the whole systematic racism that is built into the system. Because then, of course, in order to get a master's degree, we know what that costs. Um, so at the same time, so it's basically saying there's only going to be certain people that can get these jobs, period. So, you know, that's something that we have to kind of turn to the people making the policies and say, yeah, that was uh, how long ago, 70 years ago, um, it's 2021, let's try something different and see what happens. Because somebody could say, hey, let's try this one this way and see what happens. And then of course, gather the data and then do something different. But it's gonna take, you know, uh, people to say, you know what, we want to do this. Let's get all our names on a petition and all those different types of things that happen to, to, to shift those things, like Kristen said. And I'm just going to add, you know, keep it simple uh, because, you know, you're, you're all very educated, your PhDs, your, your graduate level uh, uh, professors. Um, and, you know, my mom and dad back there, uh, my, my mom went to school to third grade. My dad went to school to sixth grade. Um, you know, and, and, and not that that's a limiting factor, my, my, you know, they're, they're successful business people, but, um, 
you know, just realize that, uh, you know, sometimes our, the, the way we speak is, I mean, you, you, we have to learn almost a different language. So how do you translate your research into um, about a high school level or, you know, um, you know, level of understanding? And, you know, I, I think that that if, if we can, you know, improve that, that, that helps bridge uh, a huge barrier, you know, in just understanding the, the, the extremely important research that you're doing and, and all the time that you invested in, uh, you know, in, in bringing out these reports and publishing them. Uh, the fact is that, you know, uh, a book on the shelf is, is no good to anyone. Uh, you know, we, we need to be able to um, bring your knowledge to the field. Okay, so I do want to um, make note that Clint has added the feedback survey to the chat. Um, so for everyone who's here, if you can fill that out and let us know what you learned and what could, how this could be improved in the future, that would be great. Um, I think, Vic, Victor, I think we'll have you answer this last question, and then I'll pass it over to Sonia to close out the webinar. The last question is, um, can, Victor, can you clarify the charge slash responsibility of the local work groups you mentioned? Are they tasked with improving reach to farmers of color, or are they a general work group for each office? Excellent question. And as, as I mentioned, you know, the local working groups are mandated by the uh, Food Security Act of 1985, also known as uh, your U.S. Farm Bill. And so just, so you know, these, these are locally driven groups, right? So, um, you know, it's, 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 it's going to highly depend on, you know, what is the highest resource concern in that area? Also, then looking at the data, you know, what, what are the local goals? And so it, it is, it is going to, you know, it may, it may, you may appear that maybe um, the challenges that you want to bring to the table are not being heard, but I urge you to be patient, to persevere, you know, integrate into yourself into, into the group. And, and, I'm, and I'm, I assure you that you're going to find that there's going to be a space there for you. Uh, the main thing is that um, you're uh, creating a diverse group of partners, uh, really a, a, a local collaborative, really that's what it is. It's a local collaborative to extend the reach of, of conservation and USDA resources to, to your communities. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna pass this to Sonia for a minute to, to talk about the upcoming webinars in the fall. And then after that, we can, you know, if there's anything else the panelists would like to say, they're welcome to do so. Um, so Sonia, do you wanna take the mic for me for a sec? Yeah, thanks. Wow, uh, Kano, Kristen, and Victor, thank you so much. Really, you bring up really important issues. Some of them are maybe difficult for extension organizations like us at University of California to address, but there's also many really good points, um, especially about partnering with community-based organizations and considering our job applications and, and requirements. Um, I think those are two things that I really take away from this, among other things. But um, Kristen, you brought up um, issues of like land access being super important and also the question of knowledge and what uh, knowledge is being privileged, whose knowledge is privileged, who do we respect as far as sustainable agriculture knowledge. Those two things are in fact um, the topics of four more webinars that we're planning for the fall in uh, probably September and October. So everybody who's interested in those topics, uh, please watch your emails and we'll be getting out information on that as we get closer to those times. Um, and yes, I wanna put in another plug, please do fill out that feedback survey. We really do use that information and we'd love to hear from you about this webinar today. Um, I think that's it. Yes. Okay, so I think I'll, uh, if the, if any of our panelists would like to have any closing remarks, now would be a great time. Thank you so much, all of you, for being here. Your knowledge is so valuable. If I may, I, I'd like to share a, a, a poem uh, by one of my uh, favorite uh, boxers, uh, also known as Muhammad Ali. Uh, you know, he is it's the shortest poem uh, that, that, that I've been able to find. And it's uh, me, we, you know, me, we, you know. You know, together we can do it. You know, so think about it. I mean, I, I I've been reflecting on that poem for many years, and it it, it just has a profound uh, impact on your life. 
Kristen and Kanop, would you all like to say anything or are we ready to, to go? Yeah, just thank you for having me. And yeah, really nice to be on the panel with Victor and Kanop. Um, I have something to share too. Um, this is a call and response that I usually do with Project Good um, when we're uh, usually usually at the end of our sessions, but really at the end of our last session. And I'm not going to do call and response, but I'm just going to basically, it's something from Asada Shakur. And it says, um, it's our duty to fight for our freedom. It's our duty to win. Um, to win, we must love each other and support each other. And we have nothing to lose but our chains. So, you know, Let's make this happen. That's beautiful. Um, thank you all. And everyone, uh, have, a great, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye.